Welcome to the 10-Minute Treasure. My name is Jeff Pospisil, and I'm getting a lot of questions about FSAs, HRAs, and HSAs. So FSA, HRA, HSA. So not easy to say that super fast. But anyway, since I'm getting a lot of questions on it, I thought, well, I might as well put a video out there and that will help people make a good decision because sometimes we just don't think about it. Um, we just... We just choose a health plan and we choose certain options once a year and we don't think about what are the long-term effects of that. Maybe there's a different option that's better for you than other options. So let's go ahead and get to it. So in looking at the differences between an FSA, an HRA, and an HSA, I'm going to look at these six questions. And these are the either the most common questions or the ones that I think should be common. Um, so that's why I'm doing that. And I better define real quickly what these are. So an FSA, I'm talking about the health flexible spending account. Sometimes I've seen it see, called an MRA, which is a medical reimbursement account, but I'm going to call it an FSA. And there is a dependent care version of this, but it has different rules and it's not that common, but it would be used for child care or adult care, stuff like that. The HRA is a health reimbursement account. And then the HSA is a health savings account. I never hear different terms for the HRA or the HSA. So the first question is who actually owns the money in that account? And this might surprise you that the church or the employer owns the money in the FSA or the HRA account. And this is why this is important. Although you have a right to that money while you're an employee, if you decide to leave your church, so let's assume you're an independent church and you're a pastor that leaves, the money in that FSA or the HRA stays with the church. So that's why there's a big incentive to use it before you lose it. Use it up before you leave. Um, I do want to say if you're part of a denomination and you have a denominational plan and you go from one church in the denomination to another um, I, normally, I, I think almost always that money stays available to you. So the FSA or the HRA money will follow you from, from one church in that denomination to another church in the denomination. The HSA money, the pastor owns it. So that means that that is an account in your name that you have control over. There are restrictions on how you're supposed to use it if you want to avoid tax implications on it, but it is money that is will follow you. So if you decide to leave ministry and go to selling used cars, um, guess what? Your HSA stays with you. Or if you decide to go from Methodist to Lutheran, your HSA stays with you. All right, the next question is, who can, can contribute to the account? And you're going to see from a lot of asterisks here. So if there's significant deviations from uh, from what I'm putting here, uh, then like other options that can be allowed, I'll, I'll mention it whenever there's an asterisk. So if, in most of the flexible spending accounts, the FSAs that I've seen, it's only the pastor that contributes or only the employee that contributes. Um, there are ways that you could set up your FSA so that the employer will match dollar for dollar um, so that's kind of a good thing too, but I, I haven't run across that yet, but it is allowable. In an HRA, only the church can contribute. The, the pastor can't make any con personal contributions. And in an HSA, it's pretty common actually for me to see both the church and the pastor making contributions. Um, so how much can they co contribute? Because there's often IRS limits that will govern that. So with an FSA, the maximum, this is 2024, the maximum that can be contributed is $3,200. I, I put an asterisk there because if your spouse has um, separate insurance with a separate employer, I don't even know if they have to have a separate employer, but they have to have a separate policy at least, then they can do another $3,200. So for a family, you might see $6,400 put aside for an FSA, and then if there's matching, it might be might be a lot of money. But um, anyway, that's there. There is a limit with an HRA. There's usually not a maximum. The only time there is a maximum is, and I I don't know too many of them that use this, but there's this provision for qualified small employers. So it's called QSERA. Q S E 
HRA, and I'll put a link in the description that will hopefully help explain some of this, but there are maximums there depending on, um, uh, yeah, there are maximums there on what can be contributed there to fit that plan. With an HSA, there is a $4,150 maximum for individuals and $8,300 for families or couples. And this is for the whole family. So that means between you and your employer and your spouse and your spouse's employer, you are capped at that $8,300. So yeah, so this includes both your contribution and the church's contribution. So what happens to unused money? So we, we talked about it a little bit for if you leave employment, but what happens just from year to year? Uh, what happens to any unused money at the end of the year? So in an FSA, most of the time it'll be set up so that you can carry over a little bit. And in, the, it, in 2024, that amount is $640. In an HRA, uh, the way I've most common seen it is that the full balance just rolls over. But this is set by the employer. So they can say that you get a set amount per year and that resets every year, or they could say that um, it all rolls over and keeps snowballing. And then with an HSA, it's your money. So guess what? It all rolls over because it's your money. It's just like if it was in your own bank account. When is the money available? This is a good question. So in an FSA, it's I think it's mandated that on day one, so let's just say, for example, you um, elect this full $3,200 and you have a major medical thing in January, you can go ahead and be reimbursed for the full $3,200, even though they haven't deducted, uh, they've only deducted one twelfth of that from your salary. So that's one of the things where you can actually um, somewhat game the system in that you can be reimbursed for uh, much more than you've actually had withheld from salary withholdings. In an HRA, most often I have seen it go in on day one, although people can do just one twelfth, one twelfth, one twelfth. It's up to your employer, but the most common way I've seen it is on day one. And then with an HSA, as it's paid and as your employer actually deposits that money into your HSA account, that's that's when you have access to it. So you have to watch for that when it's actually deposited into your account. And then this is one, I don't know, this is a bonus one, I guess. Nobody asks this, but can money be invested? So with an FSA and an HRA, no, they can't be invested, at least not to your benefit. If your employer is investing it, uh, they are reaping the benefits. But with an HSA, I mean, this ends up being a good thing. You can end up building this up and building up, um, uh, growing it by investing it kind of like a retirement account uh, to where it would be helpful to you in, in actually when you do retire. So this could grow quite rapidly and your money could uh, multiply over time if you decide to invest it. And a lot of the, the HSA account uh, organizations, they will give you certain investment options, assuming that you have a, uh, a set dollar amount in there. All right, I hope that was helpful. Like I said, I'll put a link to that Qsera uh, post that I made. It's a number of years old, so I don't know how dated the information is. But then there was another link that my friend Rick sent me that might be helpful. It, it tells you what, what this FSA and HSA and HRA money can actually be spent on. So there's a whole list of things, and it's kind of interesting because some people forget that it can be used for stuff like Tylenol, or uh, various other things too. So, all right, hopefully that helps you. And until next time, God bless you.